In a quaint New England farmhouse on an early summer's day, a farmer's boy became our chief in a homely, simple way. With neither pomp nor pageantry, he firmly met the task. To keep him on that job of his is all the people ask. So keep cool, and keep coolage is the slogan of the day. Keep cool, and keep coolage for the good old USA. A lot of politicians cannot do a thing but knock. But Calvin Coolidge is a man of action and not talk. So keep cool and keep Coolidge in the White House four years more. We have a chance to do it in this year of 24. He's been tried, he's never wanting. He is giving of his best. So keep cool and keep Coolidge in our country's mighty test. With a private life of virtue and a public record clean, he stands upon the summit with a countenance serene, defender of the righteous and a juggernaut to wrong. We'll make him stay in Washington, one hundred million strong. So keep cool, and keep coolage is the slogan of the day. Keep cool, and keep coolage for the good old USA. A lot of politicians cannot do a thing but knock. But Calvin Coolidge is a man of action and not talk. So keep cool and keep Coolidge in the White House four years more. We have a chance to do it in this year of 24. He's been tried, he's never wanting. He is giving of his best. So keep cool and keep Coolidge in our country's mighty test. I would like to welcome you today to um, my talk about the 1924 presidential election. Um, we're grateful on this President's Day for the service of all of our presidents from Washington to Obama, but we are especially grateful for the service of President Calvin Coolidge, who is always the man of the hour here at Plymouth Notch. So Calvin Coolidge, the Puritan in Babylon, the Scrooge who begat plenty, the great refrainer, Silent Cal. We know him by all of these names, but there's one name we, we rarely consider when it comes to Silent Cal, Electoral Juggernaut. This is astonishing when you consider the fact that he probably won more elections at every level of government than any president in American history, literally from the town council to the White House. Yet Coolidge is often remembered only for being silent. While presidential brevity is something of a lost art for which Coolidge can be commended, we must not forget that Coolidge was a politician who stood for election and had to convince people to vote for him, just like politicians have done for centuries. The 1924 presidential election campaign, the last which Coolidge would fight um, in his life, was no different. And the story of that fascinating election sheds a great deal of light on the man Calvin Coolidge was. We will explore the story of the 1924 presidential campaign um, and hopefully draw some lessons from that interesting moment in presidential election politics. But before we get to 1924, let's set the stage. There are a lot of moving parts to the 24 campaign and the political scene of the um, 1920s, so I hope I can open up some of those parts and make it more familiar to you and explain how Coolidge got 54% of the vote in a three-way race in 1924. So firstly, the political culture of, of, of the early 1920s. America in the early 20s was, like America today, a two-party country. The Democratic and Republican parties dominated politics at the local, state, and federal levels. However, the types of voters each party attracted was very different from today. In those days, with a good number of Civil War veterans still alive, um, the Old South was solidly Democratic. The Democrats were the party of slavery, the party of Jim Crow. The southern states voted with one voice for the Democratic Party. By way of example, in the 1916 presidential election, incumbent Democrat Woodrow Wilson won 96.71% of the vote in South Carolina, which is the state where the Civil War began. So that, 
that gives you an idea of just how democratic the South was. But the Democratic Party was not just the party of Southern segregation. It was also increasingly becoming the party of the immigrant class, ethnic voters in the big cities of the North. Waves of migration from the 1890s through the 19-teens had transformed the Democratic Party into the party of Ellis Island. These voters with last names like O'Reilly from Ireland, or D'Alessandro from Italy, or Kaczynski from Poland, or Zimmerman from Germany, were the proverbial tired, poor, huddled masses yearning to be free. And when they exercised their freedom, they usually voted for the Democratic Party in droves. The Republican Party, on the other hand, was the party of big business, Wall Street, and the Eastern Yankee Wasp establishment. The GOP dominated the elite culture of New England. It was the party of the Back Bay, of Nantucket, of Martha's Vineyard, of Greenwich, and Andover, and Newport. Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, and Princeton were dens of Republican probity. Actually, I'm just, I'm, I just finished reading John Meacham's new biography of George H.W. Bush and hearing about his early life, you know, going to Greenwich Country Day School and being members of the Episcopal Church and uh, going to Andover and all that sort of thing, and Yaley, being a Yaley, it, it's, it, this is, and he was born in 1924, so he's, he was a, a child of, of, of that Yankee Wasp establishment back then. The Episcopal Church, the established faith of the patrician, the patrician class, was known at that time as the Republican Party at prayer. Very few immigrants supported the GOP, giving rise to the notion that the Republicans were the party of Plymouth Rock, of traditional Anglo-American customs and mores. The description of the Boston Brahmins, all impeccably Republican, well described the dog roll Boston Toast by Holy Cross alumnus John Collins Bossidy. It highlights the elitist reputation the Eastern GOP establishment had of the day. And this is good old Boston, the home of the bean and the cod, where the Lowells talk only to the Cabots, and the Cabots talk only to God. But it was also the party of rural farmers in Vermont and Kansas, of small business owners in Michigan, of white-collar middle-class professionals in Chicago, and also of African Americans, because this was the party of Lincoln. Um, the memory of Abraham Lincoln freeing the slaves and winning the Civil War was still very, very prominent. So the, the few African Americans who were enfranchised at that time largely voted for the Republican Party. It was also home, uh, well, it was dominated, the party was dominated by economically conservative elites on the East Coast, but it was also the home of a huge contingent of um, populist prairie folks, progressives out on, in the West, in the Plain States. Um, and the, the cleavages between the two would lead to, eventually, the ideological sorting of the two parties um, th that were beginning to manifest themselves in the early 20th century, but um, are much more prominent today. Pivot points such as Theodore Roosevelt's bolting from the Republican Party in 1912 to run on the progressive Bull Moose Party ticket portended the future we know now in which a broadly conservative Republican Party goes to bat against a largely left-wing Democratic Party. These cleavages would feature prominently in Coolidge's presidential run in 1924. The party was also not nearly as um, free market oriented as it is today. The protective tariff on imported goods and restrictionist immigration policies featured prominently in the Republican philosophy of the era. So how did Calvin Coolidge end up as the 1924 Republican presidential nominee? The answer to that question lies actually in 1919, when Coolidge was a first-term governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The Boston police officers went on strike that autumn, and in the face of mayhem and anarchy in the capital city, Coolidge took the bold step of dismissing all of the police officers, all the striking officers, and sending in the National Guard to keep order. The now famous telegram he sent to American Federation of Labor founder Samuel Gompers, there is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, anytime, thrust Coolidge onto the national stage. His, decif his decisive handling of the strike crisis displayed a medal which inspired Republicans across the country. At the very fractious 1920 Republican National Convention in Chicago, the one where the proverbial smoke-filled room settled upon Warren Harding as the um, presidential nominee, um, Coolidge was chosen for the vice presidential nod. In those days, most of the convention delegates were chosen at state party conventions instead of primaries. 
This resulted in many local favorites going to the convention in hopes of getting the nomination. Massachusetts Republicans put up Coolidge for the top spot, but the Republican Party's grandees uh, never seriously considered him. They originally settled upon Senator Irvine Linroot of Wisconsin for VP, but they left the floor of the convention before the rank and file gave their imprimatur. At this time, an Oregon delegate, Wallace McCammond, who we will forever thank for his wisdom in doing this. <laughs> He'd read the book, Have Faith in Massachusetts, which is a collection of President Coolidge's speeches, and he decided to place Coolidge's name in nomination for the vice presidency. The rebellious rank and file liked the idea of choosing Coolidge the underdog um, against the decision of the grandees. So Coolidge won the nomination with 674.5 votes to Lynn Root's 146.5 votes. I'm not sure who had a half vote, but that <laughs> we'll leave that aside. It should be noted that Coolidge was not even there at the convention, um, but they had a great big party for him back in Northampton when they notified him a few days later of his selection as the VP nominee. In the 1920 campaign, Harding and Coolidge ran on turning the page on the Wilson years of war, out-of-control spending, high taxes, and increasing debt. The campaign was based upon the notion of returning to normalcy, the good old days before the war, when the United States focused more on nation building at home instead of intervening in wars abroad. We should recall this is right after the First World War. The US Senate had re recently rejected American membership in the League of Nations in 1919, thanks to Massachusetts Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, uh, one of Coolidge's old rivals. And President Woodrow Wilson had had a stroke, which deepened the lame duck nature of his presidency. The Democrats, bless their hearts, because they didn't have much of a chance in 1920, nominated Ohio Governor James Cox for president. And for vice president, they chose a certain New Yorker and former Secretary of the Navy by the name of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I think you've heard of him before. On election day, November 2nd, 1920, Harding and Coolidge won a landslide victory, 60.3% of the nationwide popular vote. In fact, the Harding-Coolidge ticket's 26.2 percentage point victory, 60.3% um, to 34.1%, remains the largest popular vote percentage margin in a presidential election um, since the era of good feelings in James Monroe's unopposed victory in 1820. They carried every state outside of the South, and they also won Tennessee, the first time since Reconstruction that a GOP presidential ticket had won a former Confederate state. They also won women, as this was the first election after the, rat after the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Harding and Coolidge came into the White House in the face of a deep depression, but their policies of reducing taxes, rolling back the frontiers of the state, and paying down the national debt helped reduce the impact of the depression which ended midway through 1921. Harding was a well-loved, if credulous, leader. The GOP lost a significant number of congressional seats in the 1922 midterm election. And in 1923, Harding went on a western swing, becoming the first president to visit Alaska. While he was in San Francisco, however, he died on August 2nd, 1923, from what the Rutland Herald referred to as a stroke of apoplexy. I'm not exactly sure what that was, but we will never know because Florence Harding did not allow an autopsy to be performed. Vice President Coolidge was vacationing right here in Plymouth Notch and was notified early in the morning on August 3rd, 1923 of his accession to the presidency. He took the presidential oath of office administered by his, far, his father in the parlor of the family homestead. When asked by a reporter about his feelings upon becoming president, Coolidge remarked, I think I can swing it. So fast forward to 1924, Coolidge was getting his sea legs as president. He worked hard with his Treasury Secretary, Andrew Mellon, to get the Revenue Act of 1924 passed, which lowered the top marginal tax rate to around 40%, which coincidentally is where it is right now. Um, he, signed, he signed significant legislation like the Indian Citizenship Act, which gave citizenship to all Native Americans and the Johnson-Reed Immigration Act, which restricted immigration, and he enjoyed being the top dog in town. There was just one problem. History was not on his side. In the history of the United States up to that time, only one president had successfully sought the presidency in their own right after finishing out the term of their deceased predecessor, and that president was Theodore Roosevelt, a man who towered over the Republican Party 
of the 19 aughts. There was no guarantee that the GOP would automatically hand the nomination to Coolidge on a silver platter. Yet, on a number of fundamental considerations, Coolidge was the man for the job. The economy was expanding at a rapid clip in 1924, unemployment was at record lows, and Coolidge had the advantage of incumbency. No incumbent president had been booted out of office um, since Benjamin Harrison was defeated by Grover Cleveland in 1892. Coolidge did a good job of, of positioning himself for the nomination. He outmaneuvered potential challengers, and he deftly managed the fallout from the Teapot Dome scandals that had plagued the Harding administration. In a manner similar to Gerald Ford coming in after the tainted Richard Nixon, Coolidge initiated investigations into the corruption of Harding's underlings, thus bolstering his reputation as a man of moral rectitude. Coolidge's persona, um, as much as his fiscally conservative policies, tapped into the zeitgeist of the time. In an era of rapid change, modernization, and dynamism, Coolidge harkened back to the old days of Victorian virtue and warmed the hearts of the American people with his homespun ways. The 1924 Republican National Convention was held from June 10th to June 12th, 1924 in Cleveland, Ohio. Coincidentally, that's where it will be this year. Coolidge's campaign team had complete control of the convention not unlike our modern party conventions, which are very, very scripted and you know, all the de major decisions have been made by the time we get to the convention. By that point, there was no question that Calvin Coolidge would be the nominee. It was the first convention in which women were given equal representation in the party. The longstanding tradition of having both a national committee man and a national committee woman from, both, from, the, from each state began at the 1924 um, Republican convention. Coolidge won the nomination on the first ballot with 1,065 votes, with Senator Robert La Follette, who will feature a little later in the story, winning 34 votes. The real question at the 24 convention was who the party would put up for vice president. In those days, there was no way to fill a vice presidential um, vacancy when the previous office holder had acceded to the presidency. So the office had been vacant since Coolidge entered the White House. Coolidge, whose reputation as a taciturn conservative uh, was legendary, wanted someone who could provide good balance to the ticket. And he settled upon Senator William E. Bora of Idaho. Bora was a Western progressive who opposed foreign policy adventurism. He was also the father of Alice Roosevelt Longworth's illegitimate daughter, Paula, <laughs> thus earning Roosevelt Longworth the sobriquet, Aurora Bora Alice. <laughs> Alice Roosevelt Longworth was the daughter of Theodore Roosevelt and also the wife of the Speaker of the House at the time, Nicholas Longworth. So there, Bora's dalliance was, you know, um, a big deal. So Coolidge definitely couldn't put him on the, <laughs> the ticket. Bora declined Coolidge's offer of the VP slot. So Coolidge um, then turned first to Commerce Secretary Herbert Hoover and then to the ebullient Illinoisan Charles G. Dawes. Dawes possessed a very impressive CV, aide to President William McKinley, director of the newly created Bureau of the Budget, and author of the Dawes Plan to ease Europe's post-World War I credit issues. Coolidge felt Dawes would provide balance, the balance he needed to keep the ticket on track. Dawes, Dawes won 682.5 votes on the third ballot. The 1924 Republican platform focused on continuing the policies of the Harding-Coolidge administrations. It emphasized further tax reductions, collecting foreign debts, passing the protective tariff, opposing farm subsidies for crop prices, enacting the eight-hour workday, banning child labor, and passing a federal anti-lynching law. Now let's pivot over to our Democratic friends. Riven by internecine strife in the four years since the Cox-Roosevelt defeat, the Democrats went into their Madison Square Gar Garden convention with no clear vision of where they wanted to go. The main contenders for the Democrat nomination were New York Governor Alfred E. Smith and former U.S. Treasury Secretary William G. McAdoo, son-in-law of Woodrow Wilson. These two heavyweights fought one another for, and I'm not kidding, 100 ballots. McAdoo support came from the rural South, Westerners, uh, McAdoo was from California, and the Dries, or folks who favored prohibition. McAdoo was bolstered by the support of party elder statesman and three-time Democratic presidential nominee William Jennings Bryan, who gave a rousing floor speech in his favor. 
On the other hand, Smith, a Catholic, had supported the Wets, those who opposed prohibition, as well as the powerful New York um, political machine Tammany Hall and other Eastern establishment elements within the party. He was also the choice of the heavily Catholic and Jewish immigrant segment of the party. It was at this convention that Franklin Roosevelt, who had been stricken with polio after the 1920 campaign, gave a strongly supportive speech on Smith's behalf. If you've ever heard the term happy warrior, um, FDR coined that term in his speech in support of, of Smith at the 24 Democratic Convention. Um, so the Democratic Convention took place from June 24th to July 9th, 1924. Um, and while this was going on, during that period, something very, very sad and important happened in the lives of the Coolidges. Their son, Calvin Jr., had been playing tennis on the White House lawn, and he wasn't wearing socks. And as a result of not wearing socks, he, he got a blister that got infected. The blister went septic, and he got blood poisoning, and he died on July 7, 1924. So this is right in the middle of the Democratic Convention. So the Democrats took a, um, a day off of their convention in, in respect for the death of Calvin Jr., who was only 16 years old. Um, so the, but the breather from Calvin Jr.'s death actually did not help the Democrats to speed their, their convention to a final conclusion. Neither McAdoo nor Smith could get the required two-thirds majority needed to gain the nomination. This deadlock was the longest in American history. After banging their heads against the wall to seemingly no end, a compromise candidate emerged. His name was John W. Davis. Davis was probably the brightest lawyer of his era. He was a partner at the eponymously named Davis, Polk, and Wardwell law firm, which is still in existence to this day. A native of Clarksburg, West Virginia, Davis attended Washington and Lee University as an undergraduate and Washington and Lee Law School. He served as a U.S. Congressman from West Virginia from, 1913 to from 1911 to 1913 and as a U.S. Solicitor General from 1913 to 1918. He was appointed by Wilson to serve as U.S. Ambassador to the United Kingdom in 1918 and served through the rest of the Wilson administration. After leaving government in 1921, he returned to the practice of the law, moving to New York to work on Wall Street. The Davis nomination was remarkable for a number of reasons. The main one being that Davis, philosophically speaking, was not a man of the left. Despite having served President Wilson ably for eight years, Davis's political views were firmly in, th in the tradition of small government Jeffersonian conservatism. Davis's right of center views were so no noteworthy that they led one of the Coolidge Foundation's trustees to write a book about them. <laughs> the High Tide of American Conservatism, Davis Coolidge in the 1924 election, authored by one of our trustees, Garland S. Tucker III. It's really the only major biography I've ever encountered of John W. Davis. He's a man who's, who's sort of been forgotten by history. Um, in that work, Garland describes Davis thus. As the nation moved towards the presidential election of 1924, Davis was recognized as a remarkable candidate. He was one of those rare men who seemed without exception to have gained the trust, respect, and love of his associates. In college, in Congress, before the bar, and in England. He brought a brilliant intellect, an easygoing graciousness, and unquestioned integrity to everything he did. And to politics, he also brought a well-reasoned conservatism based on solid Jeffersonian tenets. As the Democrats nominated a candidate and perhaps turned to their last conservative nominee, they could not have found a more worthy man than John W. Davis. I should also note that the Democrats nominated Governor Charles W. Bryan of Nebraska, brother of William Jennings Bryan, for the vice presidency. Additionally, the Democratic Party platform supported lower tariff rates, a graduated income tax, farm relief and farm subsidies, Philippine independence, a national re referendum on the League of Nations, strict enforcement of antitrust laws, and public works projects to reduce unemployment. Now, as you may have noticed, both of the major party candidates in the story thus far have been right of center conservative types. The reality was certainly not lost on um, the substantial segment of the population at the time that was on the left. In the face of the Coolidge-Davis race, a number of unsatisfied politicians decided to resurrect Theodore Roosevelt's um, old progressive party to provide a left-wing choice for the voters in November. 
Their standard bearer was a Republican United States Senator from Wisconsin, one Robert M. LaFollette, Jr. LaFollette had originally gone to the Republican National Convention with the aim of foiling the conservative Coolidge. As the favorite son of Wisconsin, his state's delegates voted for him. The near unanimous support uh, for Coolidge outside of Wisconsin, however, convinced LaFollette that attempting to oust Coolidge at this late stage would be a fool's errand. He decided instead to stand for the presidency as a progressive, and the party nominated him right there in Cleveland less than a month later. To add a bit of bipartisan flair to the ticket, LaFollette chose Democratic Senator Burton K. Wheeler of Montana um, as his running mate. The progressive party stood on a platform of public ownership of utilities, such as water and railroads, breaking up industrial monopolies, government subsidies for farmers, hiking the inheritance tax, and decreased military spending. Sounds like they were feeling the burn, right? <laughs> so now the three parties have their presidential candidates. What happened next? Well, of course, the Republicans advised the nation to keep cool with Coolidge. This slogan perfectly taps in, tapped into the spirit of the age. The economy was strong. Threats from abroad were virtually non-existent. Europe was at peace. Stay the course was the most shrewd argument a campaign could make, given those fundamentals. Garland Tucker describes the 24 campaign this way. The Republican campaign strategy was, was simple but brilliant. Ignore the opponents, claim complete credit for the nation's prosperity, dispatch a Dawes to rouse the GOP faithful, and let Coolidge be Coolidge by, by showcasing his virtues and character. President Coolidge's campaign pioneered the new media of the era radio and newsreels. He certainly never cut a hugely compelling figure on the big screen, but he had a voice that carried quite well over radio. And he took advantage of the radio to reach millions with his campaign speeches, while, while advertising executive Bruce Barton helped promote an appealing homespun image of the president through interviews, magazine profiles, and the publication of his speeches. Barton described the strategy thus. Three essentials of effective advertising are one, brevity, two, simple words, and three, sincerity. President Coolidge exhibited these characteristics in spades. With the president mourning the loss of his son, vice presidential nominee Charles Dawes was dispatched as the campaign spokesman on the stump. He was a fiery orator and had a flair for taking down the progressives and La Follette in particular. He once described the progressives as socialists who fly the red flag and asked his crowd, where do you stand? With the president, on the constitution, with the flag, or on the sinking sands of socialism? <laughs> the Coolidge campaign also employed the Coolidge-Dawes Lincoln tour. The idea for the tour came from a number of President Coolidge's childhood friends from here in Plymouth Notch. The aim of the tour was to acquaint Americans from sea to shining sea with the down-home Coolidge his friends here at the Notch knew so well. The caravan left from Plymouth Notch and embarked on the famous Lincoln Highway. This move was intentional. The tourists sought to tie President Coolidge to Abe Lincoln, the idolized premier Republican president. Author Larry Krug describes the atmosphere at Lincoln tour rallies. As the caravan approached towns, be it morning, afternoon, or night, there was a festive atmosphere. Horns honked, there were police escorts and school marching bands, local political groups, pennants, and flags. All in all, they visited 300 communities in 56 days. Coolidge gave his, his acceptance speech on the 14th of August. Relentlessly on message, he promoted the tariff and Andrew Mellon's tax cut plan. He said, I favor the American system of individual enterprise, and I am opposed to any general extension of government ownership and control. I believe not only in advocating economy and public expenditure, but in its practical application and actual accomplishment. Later in August, he visited his father right here in Plymouth Notch, Vermont. But even then, he remained in campaign mode. In contrast with the highfalutin vacation of Davis on a golf course in Maine, Coolidge returned to the family homestead in, in Vermont, where pho photographers relentlessly photographed him bailing hay in his overalls or fishing in the creek. The press ate it up. Every newspaper in the country ran images of the down-home Coolidge and the bucolic scenes of the president at Plymouth Notch. An additional public relations coup took place on this Vermont vacation. 
On their New England retreat, President and Mrs. Coolidge were attended by three heavy hitters on the scene of American business, Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, and Harvey Firestone. The image of these three great men outside the Coolidge homestead with Cal, Grace, and the Colonel remains one of the most iconic Coolidge images to this day. Garland Tucker describes the, re the reaction to this scene. These three capitalists symbolized the American prosperity that the nation was enjoying. While the setting was as familiar and as reassuring as the average American's childhood recoll recollections of a Sunday afternoon at the grandparents' farm, millions of Americans were thought to have been chuckling approvingly over their morning coffee at the sight of old silent Cal up on the farm in Vermont with those big shot millionaires. While Coolidge did not actually participate in the campaign hustings we'd expect of a presidential candidate today, he did give a number of important speeches outlining his governing philosophy, which were broadcast throughout the country and heard by millions of Americans. On the 24th of October, the president delivered a major address to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Washington. This speech encapsulated Coolidge's common sense conservative beliefs. He spoke against the growing burden of taxation, extolling the melon tax cuts, and decrying the, quote, thousands upon thousands of organizations ceaselessly clamoring and agitating for government action that would increase the burden upon the taxpayer by increasing the cost of government, unquote. He promised to commit himself to the practice of public economy and insistence upon its rigid and drastic enforcement. The speech he gave on election eve was heard from coast to coast by the largest audience ever recorded. On election day, the 4th of November, Coolidge stated, I have conducted a campaign that I think will not leave me anything to be sorry for, whether I am elected or not. Davis waged an aggressive campaign, attacking the Republicans as the party of corruption and bravely denouncing the Ku Klux Klan where Coolidge would not, but he fared poorly outside the South. In the end, Coolidge won 54% of the vote compared to 28.8% for Davis and a healthy 16.6% for La Follette. He compiled 382 electoral votes in 35 states. He won every region of the country outside of the South and Wisconsin, and the Republicans maintained control of both chambers of the U.S. Congress. The people appreciated Coolidge's steady hand at the national till and affirmed their faith in the man from Plymouth Notch, and we are very grateful that they did. Thank you very much. Does anyone, does anyone have any questions? It was a whirlwind, huh? <laughs> yes, sir. But at the same time, in 1924, they had the beginnings of the National Socialists mm -hmm. causing, causing problems in Germany. And of course, at the same time, the Bolsheviks and Lenin had, had fully taken control of Russia. Um, during the election cycle, were there, were there discussions, were there concerns about what might be happening in, in Russia and Germany, or was that not on the scene yet? That's a very good question. Um, those issues weren't really campaign issues in, at that time. As I mentioned, the, this was a, a protectionist era and a, an isolationist era. So the, the mentality of the American people really was not concerned about what was going on in Europe. And you're right, looking in, in hindsight, 24, the early 20s, that period, there were a lot of important things that were happening um, in Europe, in Russia, in Germany, et cetera, that would have ramifications in the following decade and you know, leading up to the Second World War. But the people at that time just really had no concept that, that would be a thing. I mean, even, even most Germans and Europeans didn't have a concept that, that, that Hitler would be um, you know, a, a, a real factor because his party was still very on the fringe, very much on the fringe, and um, he'd gone to, to jail after the beer hall putsch in, in Munich in 1924. So, you know, he, okay, this, this guy, he made trouble, now he's in jail, we can all forget about him. But we know now that's where he authored Mein Kampf while in, in prison in 24 after the beer, beer hall putsch. Um, so, yeah, people, they just, foreign affairs was not really an important consideration for folks at that time. They were, they were tired of um, the intervention in, in Europe. You have to consider, the, the First World War was the, was the first time that America had involved itself in um, an, an entanglement in Europe in history. We'd never gone over to, to, to fight a, a, 
a European war before. And there was a lot of blowback um, against Wilson for having done that. And especially since Wilson ran in, in 1916 on the slogan, he kept us out of the war. So by the time 20 and 24 came around, everybody was just like, no more of this um, military adventurism abroad. So they turned in and, and um, Coolidge benefited from that. The, the, the failures of the Wilson administration crippled the Democratic Party right through the 1920s. It, it was not until the Depression and, and Hoover's uh, mismanagement of the Depression that the Democrats got their mojo back. But the war, we, we, we tend to forget about that. The, 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 um, the dislike for Wilson's policies in the First World War really crippled the Democratic Party through the 1920s. Any, any other questions? Wow. I'm very thorough, I see. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming. I hope you, oh, Mimi, you have a question. I'm just going to say, this is just an observation. As you know, I've been involved for many, many years. And today, I heard at least four things that I didn't know before. So I congratulate you on your scholarship and research. <laughs> Very good. That, I'm, I'm doing my job, earning my paycheck there. <laughs> <laughs> So keep cool and keep Coolidge in the White House four years more. We have a chance to do it in this year of 24. He's been tried, he's never wanting. He is giving of his best. So keep cool and keep Coolidge in our country's mighty test.